welcome to Austin, where I happen to be today, um, working from home. So the purpose of this webinar is to give everybody an idea about some differences between transforming the experience-based brain, uh, touch skills training, and also the difference between those and somatic resilience and regulation. So I'm gonna start off first by just briefly saying that all three of them have huge positive qualities, all three trainings. Uh, somatic resilience and regulation is the top of the tier. So if we're looking at the training, somatic resilience regulation would be the highest one. That's considered uh, kind of like the master class. In order to get into that, you have to have meet certain criteria. One of those criteria is completion of transforming the experience-based brain or touch skills for trauma, train, uh, trauma therapists. Either one of those programs meet the criteria. So if you don't meet all the criteria for somatic resilience regulation, this is a way to do it. When I think about transforming the experience-based brain, it comes from the biggest difference is it's being taught by a therapist, um, a clinical therapist, instead of uh, just from uh, one standpoint. So it's got a more broad view of looking at it and we bring a lot of attachment in, we bring in um, a lot of heart. It's definitely working from a place of compassion, uh, coming in from a place of empathy, uh, being able to do early repairs, um, working on regulation with the client. Um, we also bring in another portion of it, which is uh, as we move through the training, we go into the language of trauma understanding we work with uh, a parts model and we work with coming in on how to integrate that into uh, to the, the touch work that's already occurring. Um, and we bring in another part, which is working with primitive reflexes. So if I was gonna break these down, what are the things that transforming the experience brain pops on is it's popping on the from the moment of conception and before all the way through the prenatal and the perinatal period it includes um, developmental traumas an interesting word in itself what is developmental trauma who knows i mean developmental trauma has a lot of different meanings for a lot of different people um, when we look at it from the adverse childhood experience study they went all the way through the age of 18 when they were doing their research, and they're still doing the research on childhood. Um, they went all the way through the age of 18. The reason they did that is they were collecting the data, trying to figure out why people were dropping out of a weight loss program, and they discovered that these people had early trauma or had experienced trauma growing up. So we could say the developmental trauma went all the way to the age of 18. Oftentimes, when I look at developmental trauma, I'm always curious about what the client's earliest memory is. If they can't remember anything up to high school, then all that big period is definitely affected by developmental trauma. It, the idea of developmental trauma is that it's based around survival. It's based around what do I need to do to stay alive? Because we're one of the only mammals, of course, who has to really be connected to someone to survive. So when we look at that, we think about the babies, it's more about what are they instituting? What are they bringing into um, the world so that they can uh, be safer? Uh, when we go back to Bowlby's work on attachment, we know that safe haven is extremely important. So in transforming the experience-based brain, we work a lot on developing a safe haven. We do a lot of uh, work around a safe haven, uh, creatively understanding that if someone doesn't feel safe, they can't heal. Um, safety, without safety, we're always in activation. Uh, Bruce Perry's work and others have shown us that in a constant state of activation, our ability to learn when the sympathetic nervous system is raising up, uh, coming into uh, an alert or a threat response. As it raises, you know, if it's flat when it begins and it raises until the parasympathetic meets it and brings it back down, 
it's going to cause the body to keep shutting down. And by shutting down, I mean the frontal cortex shuts down, your ability to learn shuts down. So when we look at developmental trauma, we think more about high tone dorsal, which means that somebody was fight, flight, freeze, 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 high tone dorsal. Can't, you don't just move into high tone dorsal, you exhaust the freeze state is what's actually taking place. Freeze just can't do what it's supposed to do. So we move over into this new place, which takes a lot of cost. Uh, we sometimes think about the cost of doing business. When we think about the cost of doing business for high tone dorsal, it's huge on the system. Um, it doesn't take very much. We know from the childhood, um, the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, we know from that that people who have developmental trauma that's unresolved oftentimes die younger or have multiple um, autoimmune issues or have other health issues such as diabetes, arthritis, um, other things begin to start showing up and their systems begin to break down. There's just not enough there to support it. So high tone dorsal costs a lot on the system. The other part it's costing on too, it's costing on your ability to learn, your ability to grow, your ability to develop, your ability to have relationships. All of those parts are affected because when we go into fight, flight, and freeze, 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 freeze over at the high tone dorsal, it's all about my survival. We're no longer generous. It's like in the beginning, if you think about someone who their normal is, is pretty good and they're not living in high tone dorsal and they have a child and an explosion happens, they grab the child and they run. When you get into high tone dorsal, it's not unusual that the person is not even capable to grab their child. They might go, oh, I got to get my child and go back and have a cognitive reaction, but there's nothing happening unconsciously because there's not enough space in the survival for more than one person. So when someone has developmental trauma, they're always spending. They're spending everything they have. They're constantly spending in order to stay safe because the safer they are, which could be isolation, it could be complete avoidance. It could be um, a disorganized attachment that's moving all the time saying, okay, I need to be secure in this position or I need to be avoidant with this person or anxious in this situation. And it adjusts uh, what it needs to do. So disorganized moving all the time. Um, disorganized probably should have been called floating attachment because it floats. It floats through all the others and it's, it makes it more difficult and more complicated to develop any sort of long-term relationships um, or learning. So all of these are being affected when we talk about developmental trauma. It's a much broader uh, definition, but uh, the long-term effects are devastating. So when we're working with someone, sometimes it's more about the symptoms that they're presenting. Symptoms, we, I look at symptoms from the standpoint that every symptom that somebody reports is actually a defensive accommodation. So over here, I'm, I'm listing these defensive accommodations, one after another after another. And when I list those defensive accommodations, they're all the symptoms. And maybe the symptoms are behavioral, maybe they're internal, maybe they're physical, Whatever those symptoms are, they're all being listed as defensive accommodation because those symptoms are actually acting as a type of faux parasympathetic. Because when we're in high tone dorsal and our sympathetic is up, our parasympathetic has a very difficult time of meeting it where it is. So through the frustration, it's going to be shooting right past it, or shooting through it. It's just not meeting it in that place of understanding or the place of working. So we pile on these defensive accommodations. We push that and they push it down. 
where the parasympathetic comes up and meets it, and together they lower like this kind of motion. It's like, oh, there you are. Oh, everything's fine, great to know. Let's relax and come down. And it brings your sympathetic back into um, a more regular or window of tolerance, whatever uh, words you're used to, it brings it back into regulation. But when we're looking at it, we're thinking, okay, it's all the way up and it's elevated all the time. The defensive accommodations lay on top of it and push it down. They're weights. They're like coming in and going, okay, let's add more weight to this. Let's bring more weight in. And the way it does it through behaviors or actions or whatever your defensive accommodation could be addiction, it could be uh, isolation, whatever those symptoms are. I don't have any friends. Okay, uh, nobody, you know, my life is, I'm isolated. All of those things are symptoms. So those symptoms become defensive accommodations and understanding that we find a place of gratitude for those. We want to be grateful for all of those early parts because what they're doing is they're telling us over here in the defensive accommodations, they're telling us, oh yeah, you know, without these, I might die. So that's why we come in and we find gratitude for the defensive accommodations. We understand that if somebody's acting out or somebody um, is screaming or yelling or whatever they're doing, trying to manage their behavior, that they're doing that because they're moving towards safety and it's that faux sense of safety coming in because they're acting like the parasympathetic and they're pushing the sympathetic down. So it's a whole different way of looking at it when we consider, okay, this is their normal. Whatever all of these are listed over here, all the defensive accommodations, that's their normal. They're not, the pathology-wise, they're not sick, they're not crazy, they're not any of those kind of words or language. They're just well managed in their defensive accommodations. The only way I can change defensive accommodations, um, which in traditional talk therapy is we create this atmosphere and we may try to talk to somebody. We're using prefrontal cortex in relationship. When we're doing transforming the experience-based brain, we're showing up in a somatic form. We're coming in to do touch and part of the regulation as well as language and uh, repair some of the primitive reflexes, but we're really coming in and supporting a system. We kind of, it's no longer our issues, it's the client's issue, and in the beginning we show up. And in that beginning, we're doing a lot of giving. A lot of giving. Looking at it from the idea of the triangle of healing and thinking in a triangle of healing, the bottom part is, I don't know. Well, why do you feel this way? I don't know. When did you start? I don't know. And the client has a whole lot of I don't know answers coming in. And then they move out of I don't know and it starts becoming illogical. Like, I don't know. Well, maybe. So the next illogical is more about, well, maybe it's because we lived in the last house on the right and it had pink shutters and a green fence. So because of that, I'm not able to have relationships today. So you can see that illogical, well, maybe stage, going from I don't know to well, maybe, is kind of a guess. The illogical is, I don't know, but I'll guess. I'll guess it into believing. And then they move out of that and they move on up into the next stage, which is more concrete. Concrete says, yes, but, you know, if I could, one of the things that helps depression is, is exercise. We all know that, it's proven. There's tons of studies that show get moving to get out of depression. And it's, so we say to our client, you know, I need for you to add on 
exercise. I want you to start walking around the block once a day. And they go, yes, but yes, I want to do that. You know, I really, I really want to be able to show up and I really want to do that. But, you know, there's a dog that barks down the street. So I, I, I can't do that. Or, well, you don't know how long my driveway is. And I get responses like that. You know, that may sound kind of what? To us, you know, we might be going, what does that mean? And that's kind of an illogical, right on the edge of illogical and concrete. They want to get better, but they can only figure out it has to fit a very prescribed set of events. It can't fit something different or out of the box. It's coming in and saying, okay, in order for me to get better, I'm only going to be able to do this. And if what you're saying doesn't match what they've decided, they're not going to do it. It's going to be coming back with a lot of yes, but. Yes, I really want to do that, but, you know, it can be frustrating for the therapist. It's also frustrating for the, for the client. We also back up and we go to I don't know, illogical and concrete, and we realize that all three of the early parts are related to developmental ruptures in their life. And by relating them to the developmental ruptures, I'm looking at them and I'm going, oh yeah, external locus of control. Someone out here is causing what's happening inside me. It's yes, but is out there. Uh, you know, well, maybe it's all out there. It's trying to guess. Nothing is coming internal yet. So they're in a strong state of external locus of control. They're looking at it from that standpoint. It's somebody else's fault or somebody else is causing this. You know, if you would just show up on time, my life would be better. I would be more centered and grounded. All sorts of conversations around that that we begin to look at. As we move out of those bottom three, though, we move into even though. Even though is the first time, if we look at the bottom three, we also have to add in there disorganized autonomic nervous system, meaning the autonomic nervous system is working, but it's working in a stress situation because it's living on the stress of trying to keep survival and it's not running the way it's supposed to. So as we move into even though, this is the first sign of true self-regulation. The client or the person says, you know, uh, even though there's a dog that barks down the street, when I go to walk, I can get past that dog without being afraid. I can just talk to myself all the way through it. That's that even though part even though something that was scary for me or threatening to me in the past is still there, I can see it and I can change it. I can change it by the way that I'm responding and the way that I'm acting towards it. That's that self-regulation is coming in for the first time. All of a sudden, life gets easier. I'm willing to take more risk now. I'm able to... Uh, maybe even have friends now. If I haven't been having friends, maybe I can date or have a social relationship. Uh, maybe I'll have better relationship with my kids when I realize that their behavior and I can go, you know, even though they're doing this, they're not doing it towards me. Or even though I'm still afraid, I can take these steps and I can go forward. When you've never lived in a regulated system, when you've never had the opportunity to experience any sense of self-regulation, and all of a sudden your life goes kabloom, here I am. Now I can self-regulate. The world isn't so scary. The world begins to become manageable. I can figure out from my prefrontal cortex. Now what's happened all the way up to then has been in our reptilian brain. And it's been managed by our amygdala telling us, our hypothalamus and telling everything, 
fear, fear, fear. So our HPA access has been producing all these chemicals and we've been in a constant state of alert. Not an easy lens to see the world through. Not an easy lens at all, a very complicated lens because it's not even about should I trust someone or something or someplace? It's about what can I do to be safe because I don't trust. And then I'm moving into this new place and so called self-regulation. And I've gone from the reptilian brain and I've moved up to the prefrontal cortex. And so I'm literally talking myself into safety. That's self-regulation. That's a whole new place. For some, it's very scary. For others, they're so excited and they, their life begins to change so rapidly. And they can see the life through different lens that all of a sudden they say, you know, I'm done with therapy. It was nice working with you and I appreciate your insight. I appreciate that, you know, you were sitting here working with me week after week, but I think I'm done. I'm able to go to the grocery store, I'm able to have relationships, my life is better. So that's why we, we want to do education early on because that self-regulation, that even though moves into awareness, the very top of the pyramid, awareness. Awareness is very significant. The reason awareness is significant is because in awareness, I've moved into co-regulation. Co-regulation is the safest world we can live in. In co-regulation, I don't have to be by myself. Other people can support me and I can support others without even consciously being aware of it. It moves back to the reptilian brain, but there's no threat response with it. So it's sitting back there going, oh, look, there's somebody over there that feels safe. I think I'll ping off of them. Or there's somebody over there and I'm going to ping off of them. So our lives really begin to take some pretty dramatic changes when we move into co-regulation because we're not using our brain anymore, our prefrontal cortex in the self-regulation. We may be using it occasionally, but overall, co-regulation is taken over, which reduces all the cost. Because the cost of self-regulation isn't as much as the cost of a dysregulated autonomic nervous system regulation, but it's still very expensive when you're having to, to actually think about everything. So we're still using high cost um, until we move into that co-regulation. And in co-regulation, everything feels better. What I'm feeling inside of me feels better, what you're feeling inside of you. And we tend to be attracted to those people. When early on, we might be attracted, we're attracted to those who reenact our earliest experiences. Meaning that <clears throat> if I'm adopted, and I was adopted at the age of three or five or 10. And I had a previous relationship <clears throat> with a parent that was abusive. Let's say that parent slapped and that parent would slap the baby or slap the child. And that's how the parent kept control. And then for some sort of reasons, they terminate parental rights and that child's adopted by someone else. That child's imprint of love is somebody slapping them. So we, that child is looking for that same replication. Oh, if you love me, you're going to slap me. So they get adopted and they get in these new families and those things don't occur. The new family goes, I can't imagine slapping a child. I would never slap a child. That's not how we do it. Uh, we're either going to talk about it or we're going to do a time out or time in or we're going to do something different. And that child's going, wait a minute. This means you don't love me. So that means in order for you to love me, I have to increase the odds. By increasing the odds, I mean, I have to pump up. I have to show you more negative behaviors 
to get the response that I'm looking for. So I go and I first, my negative behavior is, uh, I won't go to bed on time. And then my ne negative behavior is, I'm gonna dump all the books off the bookshelf. And then my negative behavior is, I'm gonna start breaking crystal. And then my negative, and it just increases. At each production exponentially becomes larger and larger and larger. And when we get into adult relationships, this is still going on because we're looking for replication of our earliest relationships. So when we're looking at that without regulation, we know, so we, you know, I say to these parents, you know, if you would just understand that they're looking for you to slap them, they do not have the capacity on board. They do not have the sense of regulation. They're coming forward from a dysfunctional regulation system. Their autonomic nervous system is not doing what it's supposed to do. It's keeping them alive, yes, but it's not keeping them safe. They can't figure it out because of the early imprint. So we have to increase a child or adult, teenager, adult, geriatric, whatever we're working with, we have to increase their capacity. The way we increase capacity is by increasing regulation. The way we increase regulation and transforming the experience-based brain is through support. Bringing support, we call it a seven-point regulation. Understanding that uh, transforming the experience-based brain has a very set protocol to get a result. The pro protocol is left kidney, right kidney, brain stem, ankle support, and then we, we're going to be doing some initial balancing of the body, but then we're going to do a limbic installation at the end. What we're hoping for by doing all of these parts it leaves a space for enhancements. So enhancements would be add-on to our protocol. So when we're working with someone in the beginning, we're doing the same thing over and over and over again. And the reason we're doing the same thing, other than the part that's different is we're bringing in more relationship. We're working with the idea of trust versus mistrust. If the system says, my experience is, is that the world is a dangerous place, or the metaphor is that I'm going to die, or there's not enough for me, or I'm a bad person. When we're working on this regulation by showing up, we're building relationship, we're building trust on a somatic level. Look, your kidneys are gonna be going, I'm being touched and nobody's hurting me. So it takes a while before you can have that relationship, somatic relationship, because there's a whole set of somatic symptoms that we've already listed over here um, as management. We've already listed them as defensive accommodations. So when we start looking at it and we go, okay, if we're just going to build regulation and we're only building relationship we're doing this same thing every week. We're building that trust up. So it's, we're creating a safe haven and we're becoming much safer and um, our relationship with the client is becoming safer to where they can begin to heal. And then we add on the enhancements. And enhancements start being added on after we've already established uh, a level playing field of some sense of regulation is coming about. Playing field could also be the same word. Stephen Porges points out platforms and developmentally, um, Bruce Perry and neurosequential development, all of these programs are saying, oh yeah, we have to repair the earliest platform. So in the language of trauma, we're working with the youngest part. We're always wanting to work with that youngest part. The reason is, is that think about a timeline. On the timeline from conception 
to delivery, we could have nine months in there, nine different marks on the timeline of development through the three trimesters. We know in the first trimester, very early on, the fear paralysis reflex is active. And that says, okay, something's dangerous outside, so the amoeba, the baby, pulls back literally can pull back to a safer position. That's happening way, way early. So that early activation is coming through. So with some, we may have to get in front of that. So it may be the moment of conception or it could be another generation epigenetically where we wanna work with the youngest part. Could be another generation. The reason we work with the youngest part is if let's say conception was okay, and then in the first trimester, a war broke out and the mother was threatened by the war and a lot happened. So there's the rupture, the original rupture coming in. We want to get before that because we want to build the capacity with the part before it. So if I come in and I build capacity at conception and then uh, say month three in the first trimester, there's been threat. So when we're coming into three, when we're coming back through the repair process, we know the trauma goes in and it comes out. It doesn't skip anything coming out with developmental trauma. Whatever road it went down to go in, it's gonna come back. So all that trauma is gonna come back through. There's going to be bits and pieces of it, of it somatically or organically or uh, verbally, some piece of that's going to show back up. So in order to come back through it, if I come underneath it and I come to this earlier part, I can build the capacity in the earlier part. So when I get to that reenactment or that storytelling or going back through it, coming out of it, the system will have greater capacity it'll have greater capacity so that it can deal with the situation. It can come back around and it can go, oh yeah, I can deal with this now. I, even though when it first happened, I couldn't deal with it. Now I have enough capacity, I can move through it. So it begins to change the effect of all the events after it. Everything after you get to the youngest part begins to change uh, because of the domino effect all of those events are gonna change. They all change in their strength to cause rupture, as well as the client's able to change and have greater capacity to get through it and change. The way we're gonna do that though, is all by building regulation. And building regulation, we use a lot of touch, but we use a lot of sympathy, empathy, compassion, awareness, listening. We use a lot of working with those younger parts coming in, letting the younger parts know, as well as older parts. We are working with all the parts that are related in the survival and with the end result of building the strongest uh, system to where the system not only can sit in self-regulation, but the system can survive in co-regulation without having to kick back down or to uh, tone down its system in order to survive. We know that whatever the system's done, regardless of what the system's done in its defensive accommodations, we know that if there's high enough stress, they can return. When we're working in primitive reflexes, someone who has that early fear paralysis and it did not turn off in the first trimester because fear paralysis in the first trimester turns into the moral reflex in the second trimester and third trimester so that the body, the baby gets ready for birth and turns and all these movements. So we see the moral in babies as a startle. They kind of throw their arms back and their head goes back and you know they'll, they may shake but they're gonna move we know that if the fear paralysis is on, the moro never came on. It cannot complete. 
because it doesn't have what it needs to complete. And as far as complete, I mean, it doesn't have the direction it needs to fulfill its expectation. So it causes other problems in the birth, causes other problems in the child. In some ways, as weird as it sounds, the baby is almost born in a high tone um, dorsal. High tone dorsal meaning a lot of energetics. It's taken a whole lot of energy to get through the day. It's taken a whole lot of energy um, to figure out what it needs. So by working with those primitive reflexes, at the same time we're working with language, at the same time we're working with somatic relationship as well as an emotional relationship with our client, our client begins to heal. But we have also have to bring in another consideration. And the other consideration is, how does that client see healing? What is their vision? What do they see as a new place, a new normal? What do they witness as the new normal? Are they witnessing as um, something totally different than you are? Or are they stuck in the I don't know? I'm here because something's not right, but I don't know what I want either. As long as they don't know what they want, you're just building basic regulation. You're repeating basic regulation until they get an idea or they can visualize, even if they say, well, I want my life to be like my friend down the street's life is. They have a, a family, they go places together, they seem to be happy and I want that life. That gives you some more indication. You go, okay, so you want relationships, so this is what we're gonna build before. So if you use some visualization here, we would tie it in and say, okay, here you are now. Let's bring your attention and intention into here you are now. Okay, you got that? Great. Now let's leave that behind and let's visualize where you want to be. Great, you got that? So we begin to pendulate. We're doing pendulation here. This one and then this one and then this one and then this one. And what happens in the visual pendulation is we pause for titration. So yeah, here I am and we leave there a while. Then we go here, we stay there a while. So we're, the visual, visualization and the pendulation and titration are all occurring while we're supporting the system. So we may be doing kidney adrenals or some other support, brainstem support, um, ankle support. We may be doing any number of different types of uh, support uh, for that system to begin to be able to repair, to be able to to find a new normal. Uh, so even that's, I guess, repair wouldn't even be the right word. It's moving to a new normal. Changing where I was to be here because this is where I want to be. Even though this has kept me alive all my life, and I may be 112 years old, but this has kept me alive all my life. So it's understanding that by working in the realm of somatic language, working in the realm of the language of trauma, part language, working in the realm of primitive reflexes, working in the realm of relationship through attachment, understanding that we're showing up as secure attachment so that our clients can earn secure attachment by working with us, understanding the power of that relationship begins to change if you imagine right now that you are holding a balloon in your hand and you gave it just a little bit of pressure, you would realize that the shape of the balloon changes. That's what transforming the experience based brain is about. It's about holding the body, holding the brain, holding these things and allowing them space, but realizing that through my intention, through my visualization of where I'm working, through the client's visualization of what they want, we're all going to meet in a new place. And that new place is gonna be their new normal. When you're working in the beginning, it takes a whole lot of work for the therapist because the therapist is giving, 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 giving. 
as you move and the client moves into co-regulation, you get just as much as you get. So your client relationship changes and it becomes beneficial to both of you. So that's kind of a short little scenario about um, what it uh, pretty well means to think about it all the way across thinking about uh, transforming the experience-based brain about supporting people to a new normal. Not seeing anybody as uh, pathological or pathologized out of uh, reality. I've unmuted everyone, so anyone uh, just let me know or just go ahead and ask me a question. If you have any questions, this would be the time. Any questions at all that you have? Steve, I have a question. Yes, Liam. It's in relation to the high torn dorsal. Okay. And it's kind of it's kind of a question, and it's kind of an observation as well. So it's it's kind of a mixture. So in the high torn dorsal, you were saying that the, act the sympathetic activation is very high. So I'm imagining that you know, a person for a long time wouldn't even realize that because there's so much contraction there as well. Right, that they would not know it at all. Yeah, they, that whole, It would be very unusual if they even knew it. Yeah, so you have this, you have this very high sympathetic and the whole body, the muscles, the joints, the diaphragm have contracted that high level of sympathetic, yeah? Yes. And in that case, then, is, is this parasympathetic very high as well? With the parasympathetic is disrupted. The parasympathetic, like if this was the sympathetic and it was up, the parasympathetic is trying to do its job the best it can, but it rarely is going to match up at high tone dorsal. It rarely okay. hits it. Occasionally it will hit it, but not as often as it should. Okay, so so that's very high as well, but the problem is that there, that reciprocal relationship is not happening. They're not it's kind not. of eating. Okay. No, that's where we would create more of a faux window of tolerance. Okay. When we talk about the faux window of tolerance, that sympathetic is up, the parasympathetic is up, and now we have a new normal that you know they're working in here in a window of tolerance, but the actual window of tolerance is down here. Okay. So they're up in a faux window, and they're, they're managing, and they may look great. They may look really good on paper, so to speak. When you start talking to them, and you find out about how much it costs them to be in that state. Very expensive on the system. It's expensive on relationship. Um, you know, one of the primary diagnoses of every adult I see just about is borderline personality disorder. Uh, we see untreated developmental trauma in children and teens turns into access to, so if I'm looking at DSM diagnosis, access to is uh, personality disorders. So they might be extremely narcissistic or they could be um, borderline. So somewhere in there, they're coming in with some sort of a disorder that they've been living with for quite some time. Okay. Yeah. And it's almost, almost, all, almost always relational based. Yeah. Yeah. So like borderline, we think of borderline as, oh, they're not capable of having a healthy relationship. They are capable. They're just spending everything they have to stay alive. And they're not able to show up to say, okay, this is where I need to spend my energy. All my energy is being spent here. So that's why we're, we're looking at it that way. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Steve, Steve it's how hi, are you? Steve. Good, how are you? Good, thank you. Are y'all cold? Good. Is it cold, cold on your part? It is cold. Oh, you see wow. my jacket. Yeah. <laughs> I just never bothered to take it off. I, mean, oh, yeah. I understand. How, how can I help you today? 
Um, I'm wondering about the reflexes and oh. how you work with them, because I know people who, who study reflexes and they spend years on those. And I'm wondering how, do you somehow simplify them when you work with TEB? How do, how do you do that? Well, I don't know that simplify is a full way, but we do it in a touch manner, meaning that we're coming in from, uh, I don't know what that is. I'm sorry, there. We're coming in from the standpoint of uh, relationships. So where a lot of people who work on reflexes, they're just coming in to work with the reflex. Right. We're working holistically. We're working with the whole person. So our results may take longer than someone who has training and is an occupational therapist and they have a lot of training and reflexes. They're just working on that. What we're doing is coming in to look at reflexes and saying, okay, these uh, reflexes are still on, are acting like um, defensive accommodations. They're helping this body stay alive and support. So we're, we come in and the way we work with reflexes is slower and it's done by the therapist with the client instead of uh, the client uh, doing a lot of stuff at home by themselves where with some programs they do a lot of homework. We're doing it all in the office for at least the first four weeks or so as we begin to move it. We're slowing it down. We may be doing similar movements than they are but when we're doing the movements, we're not overriding anything. So like with uh, the fear paralysis, if I'm working in the legs and, you know, there's one of the movements, you sway the knees back and forth. You have them pull their, and sway. If I'm working with the sway, I'm only going to move them until I hit resistance. Okay. Where okay. when so people who are working directly in reflexes would move them all the way over and okay. they're trying to develop a new neural pathway. I'm right. moving into a repair a neural platform. So okay. I want the whole platform to heal, not just okay. to turn off a reflex. So I want it all to heal. And I'm going to do it slowly and explaining to the client that once we bring this about for you, you might get really afraid. When I turn off a reflex that's been on all your uh. life, you might get scared. That's one of the big issues with reflex work and somebody on the autistic spectrum. People want to oh. change it really quick and it throws their whole system into chaos. Uh, and, and I must have told you about what happened with my daughter. Maybe because it's your, yeah. Oh. You didn't tell me at all, but that that is what yeah. we don't want to happen. That's what happened. She, yeah, so she it's, tried the antidote. Well, she did, she did the reflex and my daughter just had such a traumatic reaction that I could never do the antidote for that reflex because she didn't want anything to do with it. I, I don't blame her. And that, okay. when you look at it that way, that's why we slow it way down. We slow the whole okay. process down. We have regulation on board. Normally, occupational therapists, most of them that I know don't do regulation. Yeah, no. And there's a lot of people who do reflexes that, you know, have no other training. That's their right. own training is in doing reflexes. So they don't really understand polyvagal theory. They don't right. understand the, the autonomic nervous system. So we want that regulation in place first. Okay. As we bring the regulation, and then the enhancement would be, okay, I'm going to do fear paralysis, or I'm going to, you know, and we're going to do the spinal volant, or whatever I'm doing, that enhancement, even that session, I've already done regulation. And right. And then right. I'm going to do that piece. And then so you're going to, Don't yeah. overstress the system and give yeah. the system time. We want the system to merge, not change. Ah, uh, uh, okay. Oh, that's very, yeah. It's a different yeah, way of I looking at it that. because yeah. I have been the other way personally and it makes you sick as a dog not yeah. without the yeah. regulation. Okay. Is that helpful? Okay. Help? Oh, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Okay. All right. Anyone else have a question? Um, oh, hello. Hi, Maria. Hey there. Um, 
I'm new to your work and I'm on chapter 11 of your book right now, actually. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I, uh, is it okay to sort of bring up a client and sort of under a little bit? A little yeah, bit yeah. So, so the client has a lot of labels and she's been in and out of treatment for eating disorders forever. She's had every trauma imaginable. So if you were to work with somebody like this, do you work with a team of people? DBT is the, um, you know, but her, like you said, something happens and she goes offline and she goes back to her, her old behaviors uh, as soon as she is out of treatment, right? As soon as she's out of a container of the treatment world. And even when she's in there, she's still doing everything. It's almost like, I, I don't, where would you start with somebody like you know, that is binging, purging, using marijuana, all of that, right? How, how Good question. I would still start with regulation. I want to start with building regulation. I'm not taking anything away yet. I do work with teams, all sorts of other therapists, depending on what I need, like couples therapist or family therapist, or I might be working with someone who's doing um some sort of testing or biofeedback physical therapy you know there's a whole wide range of people on my team uh that i may be working with depending on the client what i hear though is that this client probably has labelitis they've had so many labels that nobody knows what the original is. So I would come back in and really focus on regulation, regulation, check on some primitive reflexes after you get some regulation on board, do some, you know, testing is really quick and simple for most of them. Uh, do some testing around that, but keep building a relationship of, uh, between the client and I, of looking at it from moving them towards the more simple the other thing that happens when you have someone who has so many different labels is really wanting to support them to become in charge of their care. Really want them to become the driver. Because sometimes they spend a lifetime of letting other people make decisions for them. So I want to, while I'm working in regulation, I want to be in agreement. That they know that I want their input. But I'm showing up with their input. I want those things shared to where we're, I'm not one making all the decisions and that they're the one that's helping. The reason for that is that studies have shown us that those folks who can't take over their own treatment plan, aren't in charge of their treatment plans, they're the ones who fail to recover. They can't move to a new normal. They're, they're lost in there. And it also, even down to the mitochondria inside of the cellular level, the mitochondria isn't even able to get what it needs. They're just not sure. So a lot of, with that, we're going to bring in the language. So whether or not they're people pleasing or how they're showing up, whether they're, or where they're showing up. But if they have multiple tags on them, it's usually because they're living in fear completely and that they only really only have one emotion and it's anger. And anger may be over here on the spectrum. It may be friendly and laughing and nice and jovial. And over here, it's sadistic and self-injuring. So when we look at anger, it's just one spectrum of anger. So bringing, I want to do something to bring on the limbic. So start bringing the limbic system in to be sure that emotions are tied into this other than anger. And so it takes a lot of work when somebody has multiple tags, but it's still basically the same protocol. We're still moving through in the same direction. And welcome. I'm glad you're reading the book. I'll have to look and see what chapter 11 is. And then, <laughs> it's been a while. And to be honest, I don't know that I've ever read it word to word. It's kind of when we were writing it, we read it in little bits. But uh, that pretty much brings us to a close for today. And that tells us the difference between transforming the experience based brain. It is all based on relationship, emotion, uh, high emotion sometimes. I cry with clients as much as I laugh with clients.
You have to have humor. You have to have a, a sense of your own resilience to do the work. Um, it can have profound ref, uh, results with your clients. Uh, it's, and it can be pretty powerful. But thank you all for being here today. You'll all get a recording. Um, as soon as it comes out of the cloud, I'll send it on to you. So you should have it probably by five or six o'clock. It takes a while for the cloud to do whatever it does. But thank you for being here. I look forward to seeing you in the future. Bye thank now. You.